Hello, my lovelies. Welcome once again to Strange Playgrounds, episode four, I believe, at this point. Very pleased that it's gone this far. Very, very pleased indeed, and that people seem to be responding well to it. Now, for this episode, there's so much, there's so much one could potentially discuss. I mean, I know at the end of the last episode, I said I was going to discuss body horror, which is a very particular subgenre of horror cinema and fiction, and indeed of art, which I absolutely adore. It generally concerns itself with the transformation or decay of the body. It tends to be highly metaphorical. It tends to concern itself with things like mutilation, disease, even metamorphosis and transformation. And it is, it's rife throughout horror. I mean, like a lot of... Um, horror subgenres or horror subjects you can trace it so far back so so far back i mean some people will say that its origins lie with frankenstein although i would say that's far too recent um frankenstein certainly is a is a very particular work of body horror in that it does concern itself with the human anatomy with the body of of how much that informs what it is to be human that is very much a body horror trope um but really <clears throat> you can trace body horror back to certainly the the, the overarching themes of of body horror as you can for any subgenre of horror science fiction fantasy of any kind of fiction really back to the original tales back to the oral traditions and folk tales and uh, mythologies that human beings used to tell one another over campfires used to grunt at one another before we could even scratch them into stones let alone record them on paper um concepts of body horror i mean a, a very good example look at uh, ancient greek mythology for example ancient greek mythology is rife and i mean absolutely rife with metamorphoses and transformations and mutilations of various kinds if it's not one of the many gods transforming themselves into some animal aspect or some sort of element or into a human form or something to that effect then it is them transforming some unfortunate into a monster or a creature or whatever it's um it's zeus transforming himself into a swan in order to rape leader it's um it's the minotaur it's the gorgons it's arachne being transformed into a spider because she outwove athene it's that kind of thing those subjects are all there and the reason that you can find resonances and similar concepts throughout human oral traditions, throughout human narrative and mythology, is because they are fundamentally human concerns. We've always had issues and neuroses concerning our own bodies. And of course, back way back when these concepts first started to come about, when they first started to earth themselves within our, our mythologies and our oral traditions we didn't understand why we had no concept of why so we attached supernatural um reasons and aspects to them you know we didn't understand why we aged and died we didn't understand why um limbs atrophied or why certain children were born with deformities and diseases why um we went blind or why we developed cancers or whatever so we attributed supernatural reasons to them the the concerns have elaborated over time and they've become far more complex certainly far more complex than they used to be um especially in the advent of relatively novel situations that are largely brought about through scientific discovery or technological innovation we do know now why cancer occurs we do know why children are born with deformities and whatnot but that doesn't cure us of the neurosis concerning our bodies it doesn't we in if anything it's kind of enhanced them um 
those concerns are pervasive within culture and society. If you have a look at the front pages of any, certainly of the right wing tabloids, on any given day, you will find stories about how this causes cancer, about how that causes this disease, about there are, how there are outbreaks of this and that and so on and so forth. They are concerns that science hasn't necessarily solved on a human level. Um, it can provide explanation and it has provided many of the cures and the, the means by which we transcend these problems. But what it hasn't done is alleviated any of our all too human problems with them. We are entirely neurotic concerning our own bodies. Part of the problem being that we are entities that operate in an abstract arena as well as a physical, I would argue more so, in an abstract arena than we do in any physical or delusion of an objective physical reality. Um, the problem is that we come, we conflict with ourselves in that regard. We are limited by our own bodies and we are disappointed by them endlessly because they age because they sicken because they're weak because they break because they die um we find that very difficult we find that very difficult given that we have the capacity to idealize ourselves we have the capacity to imagine ourselves as we would like to be as we would like to look as we would like to function um hence the power fantasies like superhero comics and uh so on and so forth this is another aspect of not just body horror but i suppose body fiction in general in a way and superheroes are not new they are just the postmodern versions of characters like hercules um the the heroes and the demigods of ancient greek and sumerian and celtic culture they've always been there they've always been there and in some instances are very literal postmodern translations of those myths i mean thor for example thor runs around in the marvel universe and in fact all of the uh, nordic pantheon are running around they're just superheroes now um demigods or gods as they were but yes those concerns derive from something fundamentally human and which we will likely never transcend we may there is there is the possibility of it through technology through scientific discovery through genetic discoveries and innovations there is the possibility of it um and that's when we start to verge on the transhumanist arena that's when horror and science fiction overlap and that of course brings about its own problems and indeed the those concerns and those problems breed their own forms of fiction um you get things like cyberpunk and you get transhumanist sci uh, science fiction which is very very interesting to me i find the concerns of those forms of fiction as interesting as body horror and often there is a sincere overlap between them a sincere overlap the only real difference is the framing um, in body horror it is almost universally the case that the transformations of the human body are execrable they are very rarely revelatory although they can be both if you want uh, for example if you watch jeff the um jeff goldblum david cronenberg version of the fly from the 1980s it's a portrait of a man falling apart essentially beyond all of the science fiction framing and whatnot it is the portrait of a man decaying on the screen and it broaches concerns that were becoming very cultural uh, culturally prominent at the time things like cancer things like aids etc etc um but amidst all the gru and the grotesquery and the, the the visual horror of it which is profound there is also this revelation going on whereby jeff goldblum's state of mind transforms as well and that is not entirely negative there comes a point when he actually rather enjoys what he's becoming and that's the point i come in in many instances that's the point where i come in the horror of body horror doesn't necessarily interest me so much like the the corruption and the distortion of the human form yeah there's some aesthetic appreciation for that definitely it's why i enjoy the thing for example i like and also hellraiser it's it's interesting to me the patterns and the 
the extremes that the human form can be put to um, in the interests of creating something artistic or something totally beyond expectation, something that is genuinely disturbing. But what interests me more is that point at which we learn to like it. It's that point at which we realise that our humanity actually isn't worth holding on to. That there are things within it that are actually, it's not worth celebrating. Um, it's that part of us that enjoys, that actually yearns to be bitten by a vampire or by a werewolf, for that matter. I mean, the lycanthrope, the werewolf, anything lycanthropic or, or liminal, something that shifts between states, is by its nature uh, an icon or a subject of body horror. And the werewolf in particular is very much like the icon of body horror. If, uh, if body horror had an emblem, it would be the werewolf. Um, as epitomized i would say in the transformation scene of american werewolf in london which is probably the best werewolf transformation scene in any any film ever ever captured the reason being it's full-on body horror it's full-on it's not quick and it's not easy it's terrifyingly vivid and detailed and slow and agonizing this is the point. It is absolutely agonising. Um, and that's fascinating to me. But at the same time, there is a celebratory aspect to it. Just as there's an agonising but celebratory aspect to the process that creates the Cenobites, or that gave birth to Frankenstein's monster, or with the resurrection of Frank Cotton from beneath the floorboards, or whatever, there is, at the core of body horror, an, an often silent celebration it's often something that's not acknowledged by the works in which the body horror occurs but it's definitely there it is definitely there and it's what keeps us coming back it's it is a kind of transhumanism it's this notion it's this ogden nash notion that wherever there's a monster there's a miracle that is absolutely the case and there is a part of us that however horrified we are by the monster there's a part of us that yearns to be it there's a part of us that yearns to be free in the way that a monster is. It's why the vampire is attractive. Because they are free. One thing I really loathe in vampire fiction is the whiny vampire. The the sort of Louis of the, the interview with the vampire dynamic. The one who mopes about it. The one who finds it to be a bore. Who can't deal with the fact that they'll never see another sunrise. Or they're lonely or whatever. I sincerely want to grasp them and shake them until their eyes fall out. I really do. It's ridiculous. They are beautiful. They are sexy. They are strong. They are immortal. They are atavistic. And they are free. They are free in ways that human beings are not. And I find that very, very attractive. The same is true of the werewolf, although the werewolf is more of a curse, um, I would argue, than being a vampire. The werewolf is this atavistic celebration of humanity at its most animal. It's a thing that runs wild and that has no compunctions. It's a predator. Um, it kills and it ruts and it maims and it slaughters out to its heart content and is not constrained by notions of culture or morality. That's why it's attractive. Um, but for me, my interest transcends even that. I am not necessarily interested in the atavistic element of body horror. I'm interested in the transcendental, in the way body horror, it's something that infects us and that allows us to become elastic on our own bones or that allows us to transform or metamorphose, frees us and makes us more. It actually expands our contexts into otherwise unimagined areas. That is where my interest lies. And it's something that Clive Barker does all the time. He absolutely celebrates the loss of humanity for the most part in his books. And it's something I'm very attracted to. I'm very attracted to it. Um, you find it in The Great and Secret Show and in Everville. I mean, the, the nuncio, the synthetic sort of chemical, I suppose, the living chemical that allows human beings that touch it to speed their own evolution, but not just in the flesh, but in the abstract. That is one of my favourite concepts. It's one of my favourite concepts, in not only in Barker's fiction, but in all fiction. What the Nuncio does 
to human beings is that it doesn't just evolve our flesh, it evolves our states of being. It speeds us forward into abstractions of ourselves and turns us into demigods or demons. It makes us divine or infernal, depending on our inclinations. It's the kind of thing that, if I could sort of reach into the reality where it occurs and pluck it out, I would take it without hesitation. I would quaff that stuff. Um, And I would luxuriate i would celebrate in whatever it would make of me because i'm not that bothered about my humanity i'm really not my humanity restriction the restrictions of the human form and of human the human mind mean very little to me in fact there's something to rail against i it, i i think a lot of people feel this a lot of human beings feel this but find it difficult to articulate which is this railing against our own flesh and its idiot restrictions its imbecile restrictions the restrictions of thought you know the cells of our own skulls that mean that we're born alone and we die alone and we can never realize what's in our own imaginations outside of fiction and art we can never be that we can never be that principle that bothers me that concerns me. It's always been a concern of mine. Um, I don't like it. I don't like being restricted in this flesh and in this bone. And if I ever find a means of getting out of it, then I will. I will take it quite happily. Um, it's a, Obviously, it's a concern that will never go away and will never be solved, I doubt, in my lifetime. Um, because it's innate. It's innate to what we are. Um, but it's an interesting one. It's an interesting tension to be at war with your own flesh. Um, it's something that I, I imagine that, um, trans people often come up against, um, in another way. And there is, that, that is an area that body horror and transhumanism and any, any fiction that involves metamorphosis of any kind, it's what it metaphorically refers to, but often does so in a rather simplistic manner. In a a morally simplistic manner, anyway. In that, certainly body horror, it doesn't tend to celebrate the transformation. It tends to demonise it. The werewolf is something to be slain. The, uh, The possessing demon is something to be exercised. And this despite the fact that the creatures being possessed are often way more than they would ever be when they're human. If you look at, say, for example, The Exorcist, the, 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 the iconic possession horror, Regan, the little girl, is far more fascinating when she's possessed by Pazuzu than she ever is as a little girl. As a little girl, she's just a blank slate. The demon, Pazuzu, or whatever the hell it is, it claims to be lots of things, is clever, it's erudite, it's witty, it's insightful. Yeah, it's kind of evil. But ultimately... It's evil. It's malevolence manifests as idiot parlor tricks on a on a, a wider scale. It doesn't do anything that profoundly demonic or dangerous. It just does ridiculous parlor tricks. It vomits pea soup. It makes its head turn around. It's ridiculous. It's silly. Um, I've always wanted to write the story where you get the exorcist character and he kind of... Ra- he spends a lot of time with the possessed person the possessee i suppose and he kind of falls in love with the demon or he becomes attached to the demon because they're interesting they're way more interesting than the person that it's possessing that has always fascinated me um but it's true it's true in almost every instance of possession in fiction they are more interesting characters um and their contexts are expanded beyond, beyond, beyond comprehension. Another aspect, another theme of body horror that I find absolutely fascinating. I mean, there's also a surface level of body horror as well, if you don't want to delve that deep into it. There's also a surface level which is entirely aesthetic, which is, it's that part that the that alien and the thing and the fly play on so well, where you get these impossible and unlikely images, where the creators are trying to put anatomy and flesh to patterns that it's not supposed to occupy. I find that beautiful. Uh, Often very beautiful indeed. The thing, for me, is the epitome of it in that regard. The thing is very much the epitome in that the monsters created, the the patterns of human and alien and canine and whatever, 
the flesh, the creations, are stunning. They are disturbing, they're grotesque, they're unlikely, but also obsessive on the eye. You can't look away from them. And the fact that these things are all practical, they're all there, they're all physical, I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. Give me that a million times over, please. I am so there. I am so for that. It's um, it's something that has always preoccupied me. Again, because of these concerns. It's because of these... I imagine it derives from this being very uncomfortable in my own flesh. Um, as I imagine the fascination does, it, it's it's the same for a lot of people. It's the same for a lot of people, whether they acknowledge it or not. Um, I think a lot of human beings, I would say the majority of human beings, have issues with the parameters of their own physical forms. And I don't just mean on a sort of aesthetic level. I don't mean in a sort of high school girl fashion magazine way. I don't mean that. I don't even mean in the more profound sense, like on a, a trans level where there are people who are are physically born into the wrong skins, into the wrong anatomies. I don't even mean that. I mean on a way more profound level. I mean on the level of abstraction. That part of humanity that yearns to be bodiless, that yearns to be semi-divine, that yearns to be free of the restrictions of form and of weight. That the part of us that doesn't like waking up from dreams or even nightmares, that aches for the weightlessness of them. That is what fascinates me. And I think it's it's very underexplored, even within body horror, um, even though it informs a lot of its primary themes and subjects and concerns. I want more of that. It's certainly what I try to express and explore through my own fiction, as those of you that have read it will know. Um, it's what attracts me so, so much to, mo- to, to, to so many writers, to so many forms of fiction. When they acknowledge that there is this tension within humanity, innate to humanity, that we are at war with ourselves, with our own bodies, with our own, the restrictions of our own minds and souls. I love that. I absolutely love it. However, that was just one thing that I kind of wanted to broach on. I mean, I also, I think I mentioned H.R. Giger in the last, uh, the end of the last podcast. Now, H.R. Giger, is one of my favorite artists of all time. If you could if you could capture what I want to write about, the kind of things that I do write about in a, a visual form, then it would be it would look a lot like H.R. Giger's work where you have this wonderful melding of human anatomy, alien anatomy, hellish occult imagery, biomechanical machines, architecture, or there are no restrictions between these things in Giga's art. They all meld together and become a single principle. And I love that, where you have the erotic and the metaphysical and the base and the mechanical um, and the, the diseased all melded together. The, that overlap the, of magisteria that are so often separated um, in in more anodyne culture for fear of offending, for fear of causing people upset, of suggesting the the fairly neurotic roots from which these things derive, from which these obsessions and images derive. I find that wonderful. I, he is a genuine raker of the subconscious, of the human subconscious, and that's what I want to do. I want the shit. I want the filth. I want... I want everything that humanity wants to hide from me and wants to hide from itself. I want the secrets. I want those parts of people, the sublimated dreams, you know, those those momentary fantasies of vengeance and of eroticism and of violence that we have and then we shy away from, that make us draw our lips back over our teeth and sort of make us deny them for fear of being judged, for fear of being condemned as perverse or as insane or as lunatic, which we all have. Really sorry to say, which we all have. We all imagine the worst that we perceive in humanity, and part of us actually is obsessed about it. Um, And that's what Giga does. It's what all the very best horror writers and artists do, quite frankly. They make us look. They take us and they press us down into the filth and the shit and the blood. And they make us look. And they make us realise that, you know what, acknowledging it, acknowledging those those parts of us, is a metaphysical exercise. There is something ascended that comes from the very base. And I love that. 
I love that. Barker does it very well, where he melds the erotic and the metaphysical. For him, there is no distinction between the act of, say, having sex and the act of a metaphysical transformation or because they are both the same thing and they are it's a puzzle for me it's one of those things i've never understood about waking culture that we have such problems with not only our bodies but with the sexual act or sexual imagery we generally have no problem with images of war of mutilation of violence all of that is very casual it's actually seeded into our cultures you can see it even in children's toys children's toys are a fantastic example go to any toy store find the aisles of boys toys and what do you find you find these mutilated action men you find these these male forms that are not male that are actually um eunuchs they're actually eunuchs they've been filed down so there's not even the suggestion of male anatomy that sadly you know that frankly all boys have the vast majority of boys have to in one way shape or form um but which are it's 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 sort of almost like it's subconsciously marketed to us as though it's unnatural as though it's it's disgusting these action men these soldier toys but that are marketed as though they are the epitome of what a man is and yet are not men are not men because they're not they're not men they're not women they're nothing they're mutilated they don't have anatomy at all or even the suggestion of anatomy but what they do have are little plastic rifles and little plastic grenades and little plastic guns and knives and whatnot tools and instruments of mutilation and murder which are perfectly fine to market to little boys but if any of those toys was ever sold with say a bulge with the suggestion of anatomy that all boys have then what would happen there would be uproar there would be absolute fucking uproar you would have the moral minorities going absolutely fucking mental about it you absolutely would um it would be and and that to me that to me is it's a demonstration or an exhibition of how neurotic we are as cultures and as species about our own bodies it's the fact that we we get upset when we see anatomy in casual culture it's just fucking anatomy ultimately it's just fucking anatomy that all human beings have including children whether you like to you like to acknowledge it or not all human beings have it but we are neurotic about it we're totally neurotic um and it's used it is used by certain systems and the powers that be to set us at odds with ourselves with our own forms with our own sexual identities with so so much with our own sexes it's where a lot of homophobia derives from i would um i would posit um it's the fact that we are taught particularly boys young boys in particular i feel very sorry for on by and large because we are taught from a very early age that there is something wrong with our bodies that there is something dirty and filthy and disgusting about them there are still problems with portraying like male anatomy in in media in like casual discourses and whatnot much less so than female anatomy it's really bizarre it's really strange to me and it is a way like so much of beating young boys down psychologically of grinding them down of making them alien and divorced from parts of themselves it's a means of control it's a means of inducing neurosis and weakness that can be preyed upon later on it's really really wrong it's something that bothers me enormously and it's this kind of subject matter that body horror tackles and giga is wonderful at it barker is wonderful at tackling these subjects um anatomy in barker's fiction is elastic it's totally elastic almost every character in 
all of Barker's fiction undergoes some form of transformation, whether it's a wanted one or not, whether it's a welcome one or not. Um, it's often celebratory, even when it's agonizing or mutilating, it's celebratory. Um, Giger's paintings often depict metamorphoses or these invasions and corruptions of the body, um, of the human form, that are not universally unpleasant that are not universally unwanted in fact they're often portrayed with a kind of bravura with a kind of carnivalesque exhibitionism it's like look at me look at how bizarre and wonderful and strange i can be and i love that weirdness and absurdity bizarre anatomy is something i adore it's one of the reasons i like lovecraft's fiction i mean it's one of those sincere sincere areas and i'm sure both of them would fucking hate me to say this where barker and lovecraft overlap um because you do have these elaborate perversions of anatomy i suppose or these elaborate um abstractions of anatomy in both their fictions they emphasize it in different ways and for different reasons but it's certainly there and i absolutely adore it i absolutely adore it but giga yeah if i need inspiration if i need if i'm feeling dry or i can't get something working then all i need to do is look at one of giga's collections and i'm there i'm there man i mean Funnily enough, his his art is very difficult to capture in a fictional form because it tends to defy, it tends to defy explanation. It tends to it it reaches in the same way that Lovecraft does, for that state of abstraction that you can't even comprehend, let alone try to explain. And that's wonderful. That's why it's so distressing and so disturbing, but also so inspiring. I absolutely love it. It is very much the the art of nightmares of everything we want to sublimate brought to the surface everything we want to defy and deny in ourselves brought to the surface and for me if horror doesn't do that there's no point in it there's absolutely no point in it i don't want horror that just makes me go uh that just makes me it, it's only there to make me spill my popcorn in the theater and laugh i don't want it i don't want it it's impotent to me it's empty I do not want it. I want horror that is going to reach inside of me and violate me. That's the point of it. There is a rapine quality to horror at its very best. There is a violating quality to it um, in the sense that at its best, it does what we may, its audiences may not want it to do. It opens up those parts of us that we don't want opened. Because all of our nastiest, dirtiest little secrets are in there. All of our shames, all of our neuroses, all of our guilts, all of our displeasures, all of our disappointments in the world and in ourselves are there. And that's what horror is about. For me, anyway. If it can't be about that, then I don't want it. I absolutely don't want it. I just don't see the point. I just do not see the point. For one thing... It's not only horror that doesn't do that is not only often very superficial, very surface level. It just doesn't. It's a one trick pony. It can't really do anything. A very good example is like the Saw or the Hostel series of films. I've never liked Saw. I really haven't. I don't understand why it's so beloved. I honestly don't. Saw is a one trick pony. When you when you pair away all of the pretensions of it. All Saw is about is elaborate set pieces where you witness particular degrees of bodily mutilation. That's all it is, in the same way that Hostel is. And it's boring. It's so boring. When it's got to a particular point, when you realise as the audience that, well, okay, this is what these films are going to do. They're going to try and show me the most extreme corruptions of the human form that they can. Once you've acknowledged that and once you've experienced it, they've got nowhere else to go. Nowhere else to go because there is no deeper meaning. There is no hidden agenda or met there's no metaphor going on here. There is just the image. And the image is just an image. That's all it is. It's just a contrivance of special effects. And you saw my reaction to that is a shrug. It's a shrug. I don't care. I do not care 
Especially compared to, say, films like Hellraiser, the original first two Hellraiser films, which have all of that. They have all of the bodily mutilation and the elaborate gru and slaughter and hideousness, but there's something going on underneath. There is a reason for it. Uh, there is a deeper level of meaning and of abstraction that gives it weight, that lends it poetry, that lends it depth and resonance, that makes it echo long after the film has stopped spinning. And that's what I want. That is what I want. Um, what the likes of Saw and Hostel and whatnot can provide? No. Nope. Just not interested. It bores me to tears. Now, if other people get something different out of them, then fine. Brilliance. Absolutely superb. I don't. I do not. I cannot... I just can't fathom them. I can't... It's the same way I can't do slasher films. Slasher films, by and large, they're just so codified. They're just so predictable. And they're, once you've once you've experienced what they can do and what they're about, then you've experienced it. There is no point in going and watching another slasher film. The one I do like is the original Halloween. I like the original Halloween. Um, the reason I like the original Halloween is because, A, it's one of the forefathers of this form of fiction. So it's one of the really... It wasn't the first, but it's one of the first to sort of emphasise the themes and tropes and beats of that kind of fiction. So it does it very well. It does it very beautifully. It has great atmosphere. It's shot beautifully. But what I like about the original Halloween... Fuck the sequels, by the way, because they're unnecessary. They should never have existed. Um, this material doesn't work warrant sequels and in fact sequels murder the emphasis and resonance of the original film um but we'll get on to that um what i like about halloween is the ambiguity of it yeah michael myers is a psychopath who was in a an insane asylum slaughtered his sister blah 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 but that doesn't explain a lot about him how is it that he moves so silently and seems to almost teleport at times? How is it that he can survive what no human being can? Whether he's a psychopath or not, he survives way too much to be just your standard killer. Now, I know in the sequels they try to explain this. That is a mistake. That is a mistake. The resonance and poetry of the original film sustains because it is unexplained. Because of that wonderful absence at the end when Laurie Strode looks out over the balcony and says it was the bogeyman, wasn't it? And he's gone. Michael Myers is gone. And he shouldn't have been able to get up from that. He shouldn't have been able to get up. That wonderful moment, and that it closes on that instant, what that suggests is, yeah, he was. He was something supernatural. Um, and that is wonderful. I love that resonance. Then the sequels come along because it was popular, and they murder it. They murder that entire resonance. They destroy it completely by trying to explain it, by attaching a specific mythology to it. Also... Just by repeating the same shit over and over and over and over and over. We know. We've seen it. Give us something new. The only Halloween sequel that has any weight or merit is the, the much maligned Halloween 3. The reason being that it's a totally different story. And it's inventive and it's interesting. Uh, for my money, the Halloween series would have had a lot of legs. Uh, uh, much more weight if it continued to be what it was originally intended as, which is a movie released every Halloween that was totally removed from all the others. It was like a, almost like a horror short story compilation um, in movie form. That would have been wonderful. That would have been absolutely wonderful. Instead, you just get the overexposure and saturation of Michael Myers, which I fucking loathe. It never warranted a sequel. It certainly doesn't warrant the endless reboots and reimaginings and so on and so forth. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's playing upon the most hideous nostalgia. It's when nostalgia becomes poison. It really does. I, I don't necessarily have a problem with nostalgia in itself. I think it can have legs. I think it can be done very beautifully. I think that... Um, the version of it that that came about in 2016, which is an entire exercise in nostalgia, works very, very well. Um, but there is a problem at the moment in culture and in media where 
the emphasis upon nostalgia and the way it's being prescribed and spoon-fed to us is sickly. It's not only sickly, it's kind of poisonous. It's making us nostalgic for a fantasy of a time that never was. Not really. Not for those who lived through it. Um, it might seem... The 1980s, which is where the cultural dial is currently at, may have seemed like a better state for those of us who were children at the time, but that's because we were children. Uh, it's also because memory is a terrible medium in this regard. Memory is an, an appalling medium and tends to soften. It tends to make summer out of everything, you know. It hazes everything in this golden sunshine. It makes everything seem as though it was a dream, and it wasn't. It wasn't. Not even for those of us who were children and whose childhoods were fairly halcyon. It just wasn't. People forget. They forget being children. They forget what it's like. They forget the complexity and the fear, the lack of control. They forget about it. Um... And that's what nostalgia does. It tells us lies and it allows us to believe delusions and fantasies as though they are as though they were real. And that's a real problem for me. It also gets in the way of new stuff. It gets in the way of us being able to appreciate new things. And it, it poisons the market. It poisons the market because, of course, the people with the money are looking to nostalgia because that's what sells hence you get the endless michael bay shite you get the the corruptions of night of children's franchises you get that should have been forgotten that should have been forgotten that should have gone the way of childhood um you get these endless rehashings and reimaginings and recreations of franchises that yeah may have been good and iconic but don't warrant being remade just do something new learn to love something new there's plenty out there there's plenty out there go onto amazon right now while you're listening to this go right now and type in independent horror independent science fiction you will find collections and stories that explore concepts and images and notions and subjects that have never been seen in cinema before Never, ever, 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 ever. The reason being that they are not the kinds of things that studios want to put out. They don't want to put them out because they're afraid of alienating the widest possible demographics. And that is death. It's death for any kind of genuinely novel and exploratory fiction Fiction that wants to explore new grounds, that wants to tap into new elements of the human psyche and experience, um, it's death to them. The worst thing about the worst of nostalgia is that it coddles us, it comforts us, it makes children of us, it makes us skirt clinging. Um, it's, it's, it's the part of us that responds to plastic keys being rattled and to bright colours. It's appalling to me i think it's poisonous to humanity in many respects that the very worst of nostalgia i really cannot abide it i i uh, for myself i have set myself certain rules which is no more reboots i will not go to the cinema i will not pay to watch a reboot of a beloved franchise i just won't um no more sequels no more sequels. I will not pay to go and see the twelfth instalment of a beloved franchise. Um, no reimaginings or adaptations of 1980s or 1990s comic books, toy franchises, or old cartoons. Nope. Don't want them. Do not want them. Or horror films, for that matter. Even though... There are some from the era, I think, that could actually stand up, that could actually work as reboots. Hellraiser. Now, the uh, the reimagining of Hellraiser, the reboot of Hellraiser, has been kicking about development hell for decades. Absolute decades at this point. I doubt it will ever happen. And even if it does, it won't be very good. And it's a real shame because I do feel that Hellraiser is a franchise that actually does have legs. Certainly after Hellraiser 2, there are notions and concepts in the mythology that Hellraiser 2 sets up that are never explored again. 
in the franchise in any medium or form never again and that's bizarre to me the stuff about leviathan and the labyrinth how the cenobites are made um what their what their ideology is all of that stuff is fascinating never explored again apart from in the comics some in the comics explore it to some degree but it's not enough I'd love to see it explored. Why have they never gone back to Leviathan's Labyrinth? Why have we never seen it again in the films? Ah, oh, man, I would love to see it again. I'd love to see it explored a bit more fully and what Leviathan is all about. But I doubt we will ever see it again. I sincerely doubt it. But yes, that's... um. Oh, God, I've actually gone on much longer than I thought I was going to go on for... But yeah, this is a problem at the moment in horror cinema. It's a real problem. Uh, and in horror fiction too, that we have these endless, endless rehashes of old material. And it's a particular problem for horror because horror should be surprising by its very nature. Horror should be novel. It should not comfort you. It should distress and disturb you by making you think about things you've never thought about before or exposing you to things you've never come across before. That's the point of it. How can it be legitimately called horrific if it doesn't do that? And in that regard, it doesn't matter how extreme an image is. It doesn't matter how overt the subject matter or graphic or whatever it is if you know it and you know it's coming and it's expected because you know the beats and rhythms or the template of this kind of fiction then it's not horror it's not horrific it's actually going to comfort you in a strange and bizarre way especially if you have a sentimental attachment to it as i do um if you know it's coming you know the beats of haunted house fiction you know the beats of of possession fiction and of zombie fiction and of demon fiction and vampire fiction you know it you know it which is why so often i cannot allow myself to legitimately think of it as horror i really can't slash it's exactly why i dislike fla uh, slasher films I was going to say flasher films, but whichever. Um, it's why I sincerely dislike slasher films, by and large. Because they are so boring. They're so codified. And they are comforting. You know what's going to go down. You know what's going to go down in a slasher film. Um, you know who's going to die. You know who's going to survive. You know there's going to be some gimmick. You know that the killer's going to be masked or hooded or have some sort of idiot costume. You know that there's going to be some criteria by which characters either survive or live, uh, survive or die. The, the, the killer is going to be basically immortal until the last few frames. Um, yeah, it's frustrating. I don't like it. I don't like it. It's boring as hell and it is comforting. That's the worst of it. It's comforting. Not surprising. Not shocking. Not. It doesn't arouse any kind of emotion. That's the big problem. It just makes you yelp and jump with your popcorn and that's it. When you get up, when the lights go up and when you get get up and leave the cinema, it's gone. It will not you will not have changed as a result of experiencing it and that's the big problem for me. That's the big problem. I don't want to explore or experience any kind of fiction that doesn't change me on a fundamental level. Um that doesn't alter my state of mind in a very profound way. Um, and that's a real problem at the moment because we are starved for it, particularly on a mainstream or popular level, totally and utterly starved for it. Because, of course, the stuff that is marketed on a main uh, uh, on mainstream levels is always going to be lowest common denominator, unfortunately. It's always going to be the stuff that sells. It's always going to be the stuff that is comforting, that isn't unusual. Because this is it, the people with the money don't believe that that's what audiences want. They believe that you want to be treated like children. That's what they believe, sincerely. And it's what you see. It's what you see on every level of popular culture. It's jangling keys in front of you. Um... It's spoon feeding you nonsense that has no nutritional value, that is just empty calories. Um, it's the equivalent of when you see a, a, a parent leading a screaming child around town or around a supermarket and they shove a chocolate bar in its face to keep it quiet. It's that. That is what is fed to us. And it annoys me. It infuriates me. 
Anywho, I think I've rabbited on for long enough for this one. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, in the next episode, there is something I really, really, really want to talk about, which is um, something that I've been revisiting lately, which is it's the it's the very particular breed of horror that crops up on the internet. It's internet-born horror. It's the Slender Man. It's Creepy Pasta. It's it's the SCP Foundation. It's Everyman Hybrid. It's that kind of thing. I love that. I'm a mark for that kind of stuff. I really, really enjoy it, by and large. So, we'll have a look at that then. Or maybe, I don't know, that we I may have had time to record some very special episodes by that point. But we shall see. Until then, bye-bye, ladies and gents, and thank you once again.